I, if I don't take care of me, no one else is going to do it for me. And that includes financially. I have to do it for myself. So I owe it to myself and to the clients I serve to live well. This is Therapist Clubhouse, a podcast for private practice entrepreneurs. I'm Annie Schusler. This week, I'm talking to Albert Pignataro, a private practice entrepreneur in San Jose, California. Listen as he talks about filling his private practice to the point of having a wait list in less than eight months. Welcome, Albert. Thank you so much for being on Therapist Clubhouse. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about to be here. Yeah, me too. So I want to talk to you about your entrepreneurial journey, and I've had the pleasure of working with you. You have a private practice in San Jose. Yes. And how long have you been in private practice, and who do you love to work with? Uh, I opened my practice uh, back in January, so it's been about about eight or nine months now, eight months. I've been in mental health for 10 years, but I made a transition away from an agency to open this practice. So working in this way was a new modality for me. And in terms of the types of clients that I prefer to work with, you know, that's an ever evolving thing. I started working, focusing on the LGBT community, and that's still very much a mainstay of my practice. But now that's evolved into now working with couples of all types, as well as working with men. And oddly enough, 80% of the men that I work with are straight men. And we're working on a lot of communication skills and accessing the emotional realms and kind of how to express that. So that has been really rewarding work for me. How interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's like a newer development. And I'm wondering how those guys have gotten drawn to you. Well, in a way, a lot of them, (laughs) their wives called on their behalf saying, please help my husband because he doesn't know how to talk to me. Uh (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, okay, can I talk to your husband? husband and so I'll you know after a couple back and forth calls I usually get a hold of them and they're like and then they'll tell me that yeah they've been struggling with kind of you know either finding themselves or expressing their authentic self um and then once I'm able to get make some contact with them and start talking uh to them usually I can make them feel comfortable enough to want to come in and then that starts the therapeutic relationship and and it's been ongoing now I mean most of these clients that I have that, that fit this description I've had for at least six months now and they, they seem they're going to probably be with me for quite a bit longer. So um, oh, how cool. it's been going really well. Mm-hmm. Well, so this, I can edit this part out if this is too crude, but it's making me think of like Queer Eye for this great straight guy. Oh, if totally. If you remember that show. Yes. <laughs> but this is like on a much deeper level. I'm the therapeutic Carson Kressley. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to judge them up. <laughs> okay. Sounds like, sounds like I don't have to edit that out. <laughs> no, no. It's fun. Okay. I used to love that show. Yeah. Back in the day. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know you had mentioned a while back that you were also working with people who had survived narcissistic relationships or had survived narcissistic families. Is there also still some overlap with that? Well, I am finding this issue with men, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. I thought that my response would be more strong with women, but it seems like, you know, a good chunk of the men that I'm working with are actually dealing with this issue. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am working with it, but just in a different way now. That just is bringing to mind how niches or niches, whatever we want to call them, they can really be complex. They can be overlapping. So this is a situation where there's a lot of overlap with your different areas of specialty. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And also I'm finding out things about myself therapeutic, as a therapist, you know, kind of ever expanding my identity as a therapist and my skill set. Um, that I didn't even know was in there until I started doing some of the work and then either I discovered I liked it or I had a strength for it and, and wherever I did find that I would, I would develop that. Like with couples, you know, I didn't really plan on doing a lot of couples work, but a good half of my practice is with couples Mm. and I, I like it because it's really enlivening for me. I like, I enjoy the couple session. I enjoy working with couples and now I'm really working to add to that skill set for myself, which I think will just bring in even more couples actually Absolutely. so I'm really happy about that yeah what are you hoping to add to your skill set in terms of couples therapy what kind of methods are you most drawn to well I'm really drawn to emotionally focused um, couples therapy and I've done some two levels of training for that already and I 
I'm going to do, there's the, the courses where you do four courses to go over each element of EFT, um, and they're all weekend intensives. And so that's upcoming for me in the next couple months. Oh, excellent. I've been through that as well. It's really intense and wonderful. And it really helps to give some order to the chaos that can be a couple session when they're in crisis. So mm-hmm. it's it, it helps more me and then helps me to then help them get grounded and start to get some clarity about what's really going on, especially the emotional realities underneath what's happening in the relationship. Yeah. And not getting totally stuck in content. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Because <laughs> the content is so seductive and distracting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm like dishes come up so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, wow, those dishes, it seems it's universal. If you don't do the dishes, it's a recipe for problems. Yeah, or if you put them in the dishwasher wrong or oh, yeah. there's a lot yeah. to talk about. All those little things like, <laughs> man, just starting to uncover that you're like, what? I abandoned you when I didn't do the dishes. I didn't know that. And like, you know, it's just it's amazing. It's amazing. And you have built your practice fairly quickly. So last time I checked in with you about this, it was, I believe, the beginning of June, and your practice was over 70% full. Yeah. Where's it at right now? I'm starting to have a little bit of a waiting list. Right on, Albert. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I'm almost like, do I bring on an intern? Because like now I have, I'm starting to refer a lot of business out because I'm, I'm really full. Like I'm trying to stay between 18 and 20 sessions a week. Okay. So I have about, maybe about 35 active clients with a variety of schedules. Most of them are weekly, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I know that once I pass 18 or 20 sessions a week, the quality of my work starts to go down because I get tired. Yeah. And I want, if I'm going to charge full fee and I expect to be paid full fee, there's, this is not something I really compromise on, but then I expect to deliver the best that I can deliver. And so to keep it fresh, I have to kind of stay within my sweet spot and that's 18 to 20 sessions a week. So so some weeks I go over, I go sometimes up to 25 and I notice that I'm getting really tired, especially later in the day and I'm not as sharp. I'm not picking up things that I normally would. Mm -hmm. And my tolerance for whatever's happening in the room reduces as well, which is not helpful um, and doesn't make therapy for me as enjoyable. So it's, it's a bit compromising. I kind of learned that the hard way. So Got to stay within your sweet spot, within your sweet spot, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah, I totally, I totally get that, and that you, you kind of find it's, it's different for everybody, but you kind of find that sweet spot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and that's something to totally consider is bringing in an intern, and yeah, having someone who either has a different, slightly different set of skills than you, or. I'm thinking, I know we're like kind of heading into coaching now just because I can't resist, but Uh I'm thinking like, because you have a few different areas of specialty for you, it'll probably be someone who specializes in at least one of those things. Yeah. 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 Oh, and you'd be such a great supervisor to work with. You have so much energy. Yeah. And I used, I was a clinical supervisor before and I really enjoyed Mm -hmm. it when I was at the agency. I was looking at just having clinical supervision as part of my practice, but doing it just as a, a kind of like an outpatient clinical supervisor, financially that, it, that didn't pencil out for me quite as well. Mm-hmm. But but bringing on someone as one of my clinicians, that's a totally different thing. That's something I am starting to consider now. What do you charge right now? What's your full fee? My full fee is $150 a session, and I'm going to be raising this real soon up to $170. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you feel about your fee? 150 isn't high enough. If I have a waiting list, I'm not charging what the market will bear. So, yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just math. <laughs> and how'd you get there, Albert? Like you were working in an agency. I know that the culture of most agencies is not the way that you're talking right now. And so yeah. how did you step into this? Well, it's kind of interesting because, be, well, before I was a therapist, before I even got into mental health, I was a stockbroker and a financial advisor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of have that in my background, just like, you know, investments and selling and all that kind of thing. So that's part, that's part of it there. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, in terms of my agency, so I, for several years, I was a director at a variety of levels 
And being a director require, means that I have to negotiate with the county and other funders to keep our programs going. And so I would always be fighting for more money mm. uh, because, you know, if they don't provide enough money to these teams and programs, they're going to fold and they're already underfunded as it is. So I was always advocating for why we need to earn more money and look at the value you get per dollar and so on and so forth. So now coming into private practice, I'm, I'm my own agency, but the advocacy is still the same. I, if I'm going to do my best work, I need to be paid and pay, be paid well enough to live well. You know, I mean, I, if I don't take care of me, no one else is going to do it for me. And that includes financially. I have to do it for myself. So yeah. I owe it to myself and to the clients I serve to live well. Self-care, training, keeping it in that sweet spot of 18 to 20 clients a week, all of that really translates into your fee. Right. And I picked 150 originally just because it was just kind of the mathematical mean of my area. Mm-hmm. And But now that I see I'm getting a really good market response and that there is money out in my local community, and so I, it shouldn't be a problem to raise it. And I always try to keep, you know, five slots for sliding scale, but I will not go more than five slots because that it also impacts my bottom line as well. Yeah. And that's a pretty big percentage if we think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Now you've got your fees listed on your website, which I had been on the fence about this, you know, thinking that for some people that's the right choice, for some people it's not. And I now really lean on the side of encouraging people to put their fees on their website. How mm -hmm. did you decide to do that? Well, I just kind of took a market approach. I'm like, so if people are going to be interested in the service, they need to know what the fee is mm -hmm. so that if they have a concern, they can talk about it. If they want to know why I'm charging that much, we can talk about it. But I'm not going to back down from charging that much money because I know that I'm worth it. Mm -hmm. it, it also really prevents people then from calling you who just know they can't afford that. Right. And that, and that has happened. That happened a few times at the beginning when somebody missed that part on my website or on my profile about how much I charge. And usually, yeah, when we get to the field, like, Oh, I didn't know you charged that much. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, Oh, well, then what, you know, what, what's reasonable for you? And they'll come back with like 60 or $70. I'm like, oh, I, I get that. That is certainly more reasonable, but that's not, that's not sustainable for me. So that's not going to work. So it's been very helpful. I, I totally, I totally recommend it as well. Um, yeah. It's just best to get all that stuff out there so that when you get the call, the client is as informed as can be so that you can start the conversation with a little bit of base understanding, like a little bit of how your practice works and the fees and whether you are taking insurance or not and so on. Yeah. And then you know whether, whether you may be able to work together logistically and then you can go further without kind of wasting their time. Mm -hmm. I also, like, I think some people are then thinking, well, wait a minute, if I want to have a sliding scale slot or, you know, five or however many, then how do those people find me? And what I would say to that, I don't know about you, Albert, but what I would say to that is that's not going to be hard to find. You know, if you tell some of your colleagues, I've got some sliding scale spots open right now, um, I would love to work with, let's say, some queer couples or whoever it is, you're going to be able to work with those people whether you have it on your website or not. Oh, absolutely. They'll, they, yeah, they'll come knocking. Don't even worry about it. And so either, either if you're trying to like build up expertise, you you know, and a, the couple or a client that has this kind of demographic or experience profile that you want to work with, then you could proactively say, well, you may, you know, you said you can't afford 150, but I'd be willing to be flexible in this one case with you. Mm -hmm. And I've done that a couple times. The other, the other way this works out is, Sometimes longer standing clients will run into financial difficulties. They've been paying my full fee for five or six months and they're like, either, I, you know, we have to go to twice a week or, you know, I need, I have to discontinue therapy, but I don't want to because, you know, we've been doing such great work. And on occasion, I will also then modify the fee for them as well because they have, they have demonstrated their commitment to therapy. They have been paying the fee and seeing me weekly the whole time. So I feel more comfortable then shifting them into a sliding fee slot so that I can continue to work with them as long as it's workable for me. So I, I, I usually don't go below, like my absolute lowest is a hundred dollars a session. And mm -hmm. that's good. Now my floor is not going to be one twenty unless it's a really very unique situation mm -hmm. Then I might be more flexible. Yeah. And the higher your full fee is, then the more flexible you're able to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we don't want to get into the situation ever where 
we're taking care of our clients in a way that's going to hurt us. You know, that's right. not something that we would usually advise our clients to do. It's not yeah. going to lead to a good dynamic. Yeah. And you know, you're, you're going to end up resenting it as a therapist and then the client will totally know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, if you've ever done therapy, and for, for whoever's listening, if you've ever done your own therapy as a client, and you know, you kind of have a sense of when your therapist is having a good day or not a good day, and you may not know why, but now that we're on the other side being the therapist, now we can understand a little bit more. But like, yeah, you want to you want to bring your A game every time. You don't want to be bringing in resentment and exhaustion and all those things. It com it does compromise the therapy. Yeah. And Albert, I kind of, I kind of know the answer to this next one, but I would love for you to share it. Has there ever been a scary time in starting your private practice? And Oh yeah. Yeah. And how did you get through that? I called you. <laughs> 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 so, uh, um, yeah, when I first started, uh, the first four or five months, they were, they felt very scary to me because, you know, I was, I just opened the doors. I just had a, just a few clients. I wasn't even breaking even, not even close to breaking even. And, you know, I had money saved from when I was the director at the old agency. But, you know, that shift of going from a good substantial income to whatever I was making with my clients at the time, I was freaking out. And mm -hmm. I was making it mean a lot more than what it actually meant. I was uh, like already in a month three, I'm like, I'm a failure. I can't do this, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, okay, calm down. If I was a client, what would I tell myself? And all that kind of thing. But then I realized I'm like, you know, just complaining about it is not going to solve the problem. So that's when I started, you know, accessing my own network. And then uh, a friend of mine referred me to you. Um, and that working with you was transformative, I have to say. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm so happy about that. Yeah. What was so transformative for me, a couple things. One was just organizationally, like, you know, having a private practice was a new thing for me. I had some of the nuts and bolts down, like, you know, I knew my documentation and all those basic things because I did that at the agency, but like how to set myself up as a business and all the accounting and all that stuff that I didn't really have. And that one of those modules, your training modules was about kind of that type of stuff, the accounting and all that stuff. And so, you know, you, that helped me to get organized. Um, and that organization helped me then to feel more confident. And then another humongous transformative element of the, the training that I did with you was when we started doing work about writing our copy and developing our website and honing in our message. You know, I, I had a website already, but I wasn't too happy with it. And in working with you through the courses, I had to access a lot of things about me that really made me who I am and why I'm a therapist. Mm -hmm. And these are things that I was scared to talk about, you know, like what were my past struggles and do I want to put that out on, on my website? And, you know, I, we, we all shared kind of our, our, our copy and I wrote a lot of raw stuff on there and your feedback and the feedback of the other participants was, this is amazing. Go with it. I was like, I can't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it. And sure enough, it was, the response I got out in the community was really positive. In fact, it's, it was a major driver of traffic, like, especially like for those shy straight guys who aren't really mm -hmm. therapy and their wives are making them go. The thing that they say why they decide to go with me is because I was able to demonstrate vulnerability on my website mm. in a fun and engaging way. And that made them feel safe enough to want to work with me. I hear that a lot. And so I wouldn't have been brave enough to take that type of chance had I not got the coaching through you and working with the other participants. So thank you. Yeah. And I remember when we were all working on your copy a bit and which is a great, I mean, it's so great that you took that opportunity to say like, all right, everybody, let's look at this together. And it's so helpful to everyone else who's part of that process as well. They're learning. But I remember it's, it's so helpful to get a whole bunch of eyes at once on your yeah. copy so that you can get not just one person's feedback, but a whole bunch saying, oh, yeah, but I would change this phrase. And, you know, this part is confusing or this part is the best. You want to do more of this. That's a really sometimes kind of scary process, but you mm -hmm. really took advantage of it. Yeah. And the other thing that was helpful was helping other people and providing them feedback on their copy because it made mm -hmm. me think about things that 
oh, well, that worked for them. That might work for me too. Let me try that. Or, you know, just, you know, either how to describe something or how to position yourself on a, on a, on a subject uh, or just even lo looking at a, you know, different types of engaging with clients and so on. So it was really eye opening, especially for me at that time, because I was so new to private practice, like it was all just new to me. So it was a really organized methodical way to kind of like get all this information and put out all this information in an organized, thoughtful way. I'm thinking too, that the way that you've built your practice, which has been clearly very successful is you've done a real combination of having this online presence and networking. And it seems like you've, you've just put a lot of energy into both. Yes. And then it seems like there's, as I think is always the case, there's a relationship between the two. So if you're doing all this networking, which I'm going to ask you to talk about, you're doing all this great networking and then having a really strong website for people to go look at once they have heard about you is really important. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that website, that is your front door. That mm -hmm. is your storefront. That is and everything about that website is communicating something about you right down to, you know, the style, have the clarity, the openness on the website, um, having enough information without having too much um, or too little. It's especially now in this Facebook age where everything's your everyone's image is curated online. Like people are very primed to assess you as a therapist through the lens of the computer screen. Um, so, yeah, I did definitely put a lot of effort into that. But also, yes, a lot of effort into in-person networking. And and they are synergistic. Yeah. Oh, that's a good word for it. Yeah. Yeah. What, what kind of networking were you doing? What was your strategy? It was, it was kind of like any and every opportunity I had to talk about me and my business, I, I took it. it. That means talking to the other local businesses around my office talking to my family members, reaching out to, through my friends network, um, and then their friends of friends, going online um, and reaching my professional contacts through LinkedIn, um, leveraging all of my past uh, employers and all the people I used to know working there and letting them know. Um, any and every opportunity to talk about me as a therapist with a private practice and that I'm looking to work with clients that all, it all pays off. At first, it's just establishing yourself and, and, and you getting used to saying, oh, yes, I am actually running a business here and this is who I am. It becomes part of your identity. But you're also activating your local community and, and they keep, and they remember it. You don't, you might not see something right away, but it's like you're planting seeds and they come to fruition six months to a year afterwards when you start to see referrals from people you talk to, you know, six months or a year back about, They'll, they'll say, oh, you know, XYZ person, you know, mentioned that you were a therapist. And so I checked out your website and I really liked it. So now I'm giving you a call. But that whole thing took a year to do, right? But so if you want to get started now. Yeah, you want to get started now. But also look at like a lot of your seeds have bloomed in less time than a year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, and I think absolutely. partly it's because I think maybe you and I have something in common here in that we both tend to turn fear and anxiety into action. So oh, yeah. like when you were feeling like you were just describing feeling scared and feeling like, ugh, I don't know, is this going to work? And mm. then you just, I don't know if you took five minutes or something, but you basically right away jumped into action and started networking and started engaging with people. Yes, absolutely. Because I, you know, if you're struggling with something, the worst thing you can do is just to sit there and not do anything with it. Like after a while you have to own responsibility for the lack of traction or whatever the, the outcome you're seeing right now. Like you have to own it. So if I'm going to own it, then I have to own it knowing that I did absolutely everything that I can do to make that successful. If you could time travel back to I guess it would be January, back to the start mm -hmm. of your private practice. What would you tell the Albert of that time? Oh, well, one, to stay, just to stay calm to the best of your ability mm -hmm. um, and, to, and just to know that you know what you're doing here. Like, it feels scary because it's new, but all, all, all the talent and the skill sets there already, you're just activating it. And just, just breathe into it. You're going to be fine. You know, don't, don't overanalyze things, don't get caught up in those anxiety whirls and just stay the course and 
put, you know, 100% effort out like I know you're going to do. Oh, I love yeah. That. And that's what I would tell anybody. Yeah. 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 And tell us about your blog. You have a, a blog on your website and I noticed that you use resources there. So you'll use like TED Talks and other kinds of resources. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, I, I just like, oftentimes I'll get either I'll see something through my personal Facebook feed that's something about mental health or something mental health adjacent or just something that's really interesting. Um, and then either I will, if it's an article that someone else posted, then I will, you know, read the article and then if I like it, I'll post it and make a, just a small commentary. But I like to mix it up and use like TED Talks and whatnot because what I find is certain themes come up, like either themes that I'm working on with my clients or things that are even coming up for me. Like, you know, anxiety is a perennial thing for me. So I'm always interested in like articles about anxiety. And for a while there, a lot of, I was seeing a lot of things about codependency and narcissistic abuse and so on. And now I think the last couple that I posted were about substance abuse. Mm which is a past struggle of mine and is something that's very much present with my current caseload. And so um, that's definitely, you know, in the realm of, of mental health. So I started just posting just things that interest me. Like they have to interest me. I can't just say, oh, it's going to be filler for the website. I have to be able to stand by it and say, yeah, no, I posted that because I liked it for whatever reason. And there's something about it that resonated with me. Mm. Um, it's, so it has to be authentic. It can't just be posting something just for the sake of posting something. Yeah. Or just like, because you think, well, that'll be good for SEO. It's gotta, it's gotta be real. And then I think yeah. what you're doing, and you're doing two things I noticed that I think are, are really great that people can learn from. One is coming up with interesting headlines mm -hmm. that will pull people in and also tell them really quickly what it's going to be about. And yeah. then you also, you don't just post someone else's, you know, TED talk, you always say a little something before yeah. that. And so yeah. it's really, it feels like it's your blog, it's your voice, you've curated all of these different things. So, yeah. you know, if someone doesn't love writing long articles, I think this is a great strategy. Or even if they do, they can mix it up and sometimes mm -hmm. write long articles and sometimes post things and just give your own comment and your own take on it. Yeah. And, you know, I thought about maybe writing a full blog post of my own writing and it's just, I'm, it's just, I don't have the time is an issue. So I'm like, okay, so I, I want to do blogging. I want to keep this up, but it's got to be sustainable. Like, yeah. uh, because my, you know, I have clients and I, I want to focus most of the energy there. If I didn't have clients, I would be writing very extensive blog posts because I do want to put more of my energy out there to say, hey, I'm here, I'm available, let's do this, this is who I am. Like, it's more than just putting it out on the internet. It really is like putting out your own energy and, and seeing it manifest back to you. Like, that, I, I know it sounds a little woo-woo for some, but I totally believe it. it mm. It's, you have to, you have to put your heart into it, whatever it is. If your heart isn't there, even if you're going through the motions, it's not going to work unless your heart's there. Yeah, it's going to feel really flat. Yeah. How do you balance your business with the rest of your life right now? That is something I'm still working on mastering, interestingly enough. I'm, I'm so I'm, tr I am. So I recently started creating a waiting list. That was my biggest thing now, which is like, I have to honor my 20 session a week cap. And also I make sure that I have, you know, that I don't let my social life slide. For me, that's a major outlet is being able to just have, you know, my weekends or my free time to either spend with my partner or with my friends and also to have my own creative projects as well that I don't let slip. And I notice that when I start to let those things slip, that my primary work also suffers because I'm more tired and more resentful. Um, and, and that comes up pretty quickly now. So I don't see it as ex extra stuff that I want to do just to relax. It's like critical to being a balanced therapist is to actually know when to not be a therapist and to go out and do fun things and enjoy yourself. Um, and the other part is, um, you know, for my schedule, I have four office days a week and, and I, if I could, I'd like to pare that down to three, but I don't see how it's going to be possible right now, but I will not go past four. I want to have at least three days off and ideally four so that I can have that balance. Plus there's a lot of work that we do as therapists that isn't direct face to face, you know, all the marketing, all that other stuff. So be able to get all that done within a four or five work, 
five day week and then have a full two days off. That's, that's really nice. And yeah. then when you can to like take those extra days and maybe go for an extended weekend, like we, I just went to Calistoga and I took Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday off, got all my work done before. And I had all four days, you know, I had a full week I had I made all my money for the week. I went, I fully enjoyed myself and I came, I felt so fresh. Like I went, I'm like, Oh my God, I really love seeing my clients today. I'm feeling it. I'm, yeah. It, it totally makes a difference. Mm, so being able to step completely away makes oh, yeah. it more possible to step all the way back in. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like when I'm away, I'm like, I'm not a therapist. Don't talk to me about therapy issues. <laughs> like I am just, I like, I, I pretend like I'm in retirement. Like I'm a retired person. <laughs> I'm going to work on my little projects at home and like walk my dogs. And that's all I do. Like I drop the identity for a few days. So, and then I get excited to bring it back on because I miss it. Yeah. How many dogs do you have? I have two dogs, Aww. two whippets. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Will you join mm -hmm. me for a listener question? Sure. Listener question. So now that we've been hearing from you about this, I, I think we can predict some of what you'll say, but I'm really curious. So this person said, I hear that it takes at least two years to fill a private practice. How long does it actually take? Yeah, that's a great question. Certainly, that's what I was thinking about when I was first starting. And, you know, there is no objective answer to that. I think it is totally conditional on uh, partly the type of work that you choose to do and the amount of effort that you put in to put yourself out there, which, you know, this field is, has a lot of, you know, people that have more introverted qualities, and that can be somewhat of a challenge in terms of marketing and putting yourself out there. But, yeah, I, I, there isn't a hard and fast answer to that. I, it really is just dependent on the amount of the energy that you have and also, like, the techniques that you use. Like, for instance, I remember in the course when I was in the course with you, and um we were talking about stepping in the flow or first identifying the quote unquote flow and then stepping into it. And what we meant by that was identifying what, what is the demand of the local market and then stepping into that demand to the best of your ability. And that helped me to build up my practice right away because the biggest demand here in San Jose, especially here in Willow Glen is a lot of it's couples. Like everyone, like there's a lot of families there's a lot of couples here and a lot of them need some therapy. And so I, at first I was hesitant to step into that, but then I asked myself, I'm like, why am I hesitant? And it was just because I was afraid and hadn't done a whole lot of it before. I'm like, well, that's not a good enough answer to, to not do it, especially with the potential that's here. I, I have no obje real objective objection to it. So I just started putting myself out there more into couples and those couples referred to other couples and those couples referred to other couples, all local couples, like within the five mile radius of my office. And that's, that, that to me is a perfect example of stepping into the flow. The flow here in my little area is a lot of couples work. The flow might be, or the, yeah, the flow might be different in different areas, but you know, it's up to us to kind of make, make a fair assessment of what's going on and then decide if that's the flow we want to be in and then making that manifest. And, mm -hmm. and if you do that and there's alignment there, I would say you could build your practice really fast. Like I did. If you're trying to do something that's really unique and very, the niche is really, really narrow and there isn't a demand in your local market for it, you're going to have a hard time. So definitely there's an assessment period and, and some discernment about what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I see in the story you were just telling, you have this ability to, well, I'll call it a superpower, this superpower of being able to pivot pretty quickly. You know, it's all about experimenting. You, you pick a niche, you pick a plan and you go in full force, but also with the willingness to pivot. Yeah. And you totally did that and continue yeah. to do that. So you're not holding back and waiting for everything to be perfectly aligned. You're just looking and saying, okay, I know enough to try this. Oh, okay. Now I'm going to pivot over here a little bit. And yeah. you just never, you never stopped. And so you were able to build your practice really quickly. Yeah, I, I basically, I'm like, I'm not going to say no to anything the universe presents me in regards to my practice. I'm going to, I'm going to look at everything and I'm going to consider and probably say yes to, and I have, I've, I literally have said yes to everything and then some, because I also put myself out there in other ways. Like for instance, you know, I want the LGBT to be a mainstay of my practice and it is. And I also wanted to expand that and work, especially with the transgender community. So I put myself out there 
and found a way to facilitate a local teen trans group that's just a few miles away from my office, I had to find them and, and convince them to hire me so I could run that group so I could get work with that community and increase my knowledge base about working with the issues of that community. Uh, and I'm so glad that I did that. And But it also felt really scary because I'm like, oh my God, I, like, you know, I don't have a whole lot of experience with that, but that's why I'm doing this. And again, despite being afraid, I did it anyway. And that was really helpful for me, just having that experience of like transcending that fear. So when I have an issue come into the door that I'm not familiar with, yes, I'll, I might be afraid of it or whatever, but I'm not going to let that stop me. Mm-hmm. It can't, it simply can't, it can't, because that means then fear won. And if fear wins, then I'm going to lose and I will not lose. And if we think of the era that the political era that we're living in right now, oh, right. we really don't want to let fear win. No way. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so yeah, it, it, it really is just dependent on, you know, some smarts and some guts and, and a lot of energy. Yeah, I think maybe where that two year thing comes from is that you know, not everybody is willing or able to do what you did in terms of, well, I would say not everybody's willing. I don't, I don't know if not everybody's able, because I really believe in therapists, but, Mm. you know, being able to work through the mindset stuff and take action at the same time, I think means that you can do it a lot faster. I think it can take two years if you're kind of going back and forth between, working on a little bit of mindset stuff and then stepping back and taking a little bit of action. And then you can imagine how somebody could take two years to do what you, Albert, have done in seven or eight months. Yeah. If, if you know, you dial back some, like may, maybe you don't have a, a depressing need to make your practice full at the moment. I mean, you have the luxury of taking more time, take it. I mean, no one's, no one's saying this is the right way or the way that everyone must do it. But if you're interested in building this practice quickly, it can be done. Yeah. Absolutely. But it will require more from you. Albert, where can people find you and learn more about you and throw compliments at you? Well, you can go to my website, which is albertpignataromft.com. And if you have any clients or want to consult on anything, you can give me a call and all of it's on the website. And I encourage you to go and check it out. Great. Yeah. And check out Albert's blog. It's a great example. Thanks. <laughs> of a great blog. Thank you so much, Albert. This was incredibly fun. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Here's an idea to try. Idea to try. You may have noticed when Albert was talking about his networking strategy, one of the things that he did was introduce himself to all of the different folks who work in the businesses around his office. Try it. Introduce yourself to everyone who works around your office. Let them know who you are, be yourself, be generous, find out who they are, and just start building relationships. I know in this age of doing a lot of things online, we may have gotten out of the habit of doing this, but I think it's a great idea to try. Thanks for listening to Therapist Clubhouse. Check out some of my free resources over at coachingwithannie.com so I can help you build your private practice. And if you like Therapist Clubhouse, would you do us a favor and head over to iTunes and rate and review us? It really helps the podcast and it helps other therapists like you find us. See you next week.